good. All right. Welcome, everyone. Good evening, and thank you for joining us. I'm Elizabeth Danzi, the interim dean at the University of Texas School of Architecture, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here tonight for the first lecture of 2017, the Jean and Bill Buziotis Lecture in Architecture, featuring Nader Tarani. Before we hear from Nader, I'd like to say a few words about the benefactor who created the endowment to support this lecture and whose memory we honor tonight. Bill Buziotis, FAIA, a prominent Dallas architect, was a 1957 graduate of the School of Architecture and an active member of our community, chairing the school's advisory council in the 1970s and again from 2014 to 2000, uh, 2012 to 2014. In the 1980s, Bill designed the addition to Goldsmith Hall a beautiful and skillful addition that I know almost all of you know. Bill was a trusted advisor to deans and university presidents, not only here in Austin, but also at UT Dallas, UT Southwestern Medical School, and MIT, where he received the Master of Architecture and served on their Council for the Arts. Bill's accomplishments and accolades as an architect and engaged citizen are too numerous to list here, but I should mention he was, had received two AIA Presidential Gold Medals, the O'Neill Ford Award for Distinguished Architecture Career, and in 2015 was recognized by the Dallas Historical Society for Excellence in Community Service. Bill was an extraordinarily talented architect, a master of detailing, and beloved by his peers, colleagues, and clients. Bill passed away last May and was preceded in death by his wife, Jean, a lovely West Texan and lifelong scholar of music, the arts, and literature. Tonight, we honor the Buziotises and their deep, enduring friendship with the School of Architecture. When Bill created the Lectureship Endowment, he recalled the impact of Frank Lloyd Wright and Marcel Breuer as a student. He cited these as important events in his education and wanted to ensure that future generations of architects can have a similar experience. Bill envisioned this lecture to be a premier annual event for the school. Bill loved to entertain, and tonight we will host a reception immediately following the lecture in the reading room at Battle Hall. Please join us. I would like to thank the many people who have also supported this lecture with gifts in Bill's memory in particular, the McDermott Foundation of Dallas that has been such an important, generous contributor to our school for many years. With that, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, Nader Tarani. Mr. Tarani is the Dean of the Irwin S. Channon School of Architecture at the Cooper Union in New York. He was previously a professor of architecture at MIT, where he served as the head of the department from 2010 to 2014. As a practicing architect, Nader is principal of NADA, a firm dedicated to the advancement of design innovation, interdisciplinary collaboration, and an intensive dialogue with the construction industry. Nader received a BFA and a BARC from Rhode Island School of Design and continued his studies at the Architectural Association where he attended the postgraduate program in history and theory. He later received a master's in urban design from the Harvard Graduate School of Design. He has taught at the GSD, RISD, and the Georgia Institute of Technology, and the University of Toronto's Department of Architecture, Landscape, and Design as the Frank O'Gary International Visiting Chair. The works of Nader Torani have been widely exhibited at MoMA, LA MOCA, and ICA Boston. His work is also featured in the permanent collections of the Canadian Centre for Architecture and the Nasher Sculpture Centre. His work has been published internationally in many, many journals. His work has been recognized with notable awards, including the Cooper Hewitt National Design Award in Architecture, the United States Artists Fellowship in Architecture and Design, the American Academy of Arts and Letters Award in Architecture, and many others. For the past four years, his firm, NADA, has ranked in the top three design firms in Architecture Magazine's top 50 U.S. firms. I'm very much looking forward to tonight's talk, titled The Measure of Tolerance, 
please welcome Nader Tarani. Thank you very much. You'll notice that the title is somewhat different, and I uh, was part of a lecture uh, last week with Glenn Mur uh, Murcutt in New York City where he, he rejected the word tolerance uh, based on its negative associations, the, the, no the notion that uh, when you're tolerating somebody, you've already rejected them and somehow uh, uh, with, with great difficulty, you're uh, somehow going to acknowledge them. Of course, in, in construction, we all know that tolerance refers yet to something else. Uh, and that has to do with the permissible deviations that uh, invariably construction always undergoes in relationship to design intent. More currently, of course, the measure of tolerance has to do with something much more political, and it has to do with the daily wrath that I think everybody, no matter what political persuasion you are, are having to, to, to suffer. But uh, I suppose uh, pedagogical constructs is a response to that. Uh, and how, in fact, uh, what we're undergoing, all of us right now, is uh, arguably a kind of vacuum of education and how to begin to instill uh, an idea about learning and the ability to imagine empathy, intellectual empathy, for different uh, platforms of thinking uh, is something that is in dire need. So tonight's lecture, in great part, is uh, in celebration of three schools of architecture, uh, Georgia Tech, uh, Melbourne School of Design, and the Daniels Faculty Building in Toronto. Uh, around 2008, when the economy was taking a nosedive internationally, uh, we were faced with all. We were all faced with pretty difficult decisions, uh, in great part because we had to either downsize, uh, lay off people, fire people, whatnot. And uh, we made a pact in our office. Uh, we, we all agreed that we would go on four days pay, seven days work. Uh, this is the, 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 really the staff that somehow decided this. And during the period of that first eight months, we did about 14 competitions and won three of them. And this is somehow the result of that with the Daniels uh, being complete. Uh, and luckily, of course, we made our money back and were able to, to overcome the four days and get into the five. Um, the question of learning and the suspicions that come with different technological platforms are, are nothing new. The idea that this will kill that was something that uh, uh, was coined by Hugo in relationship to a shifting vocation of architecture in the way that it was thought that the book would, would essentially kill the function of buildings and the way in which they materialize the narrative of humankind. Uh, that same thing, of course, uh, is a part of a mythology about uh, current technologies and yet, you all know that we are uh, changing a great deal as a result of them. And yet, we don't stop reading books, uh, and uh, we become more laterally flexible in relationship to the way that we think and we work. Spaces of learning are also coming to be challenged as a result of uh, the ways in which technologies are embedded in them and imprinted in them. All of you are familiar with the classical classroom, uh, at, which is essentially operates top down. Somebody like me s stands in front of you and professes in some way or another, and uh, the rest listen. 
But these things also come with certain ideological underpinnings. And so they're deeply ingrained uh, with uh, certain uh, morals, uh, certain uh, prejudices, and certain rituals that become manifest through the imprints of those spaces. And for that reason, spaces are never neutral. We know that. They are always already pregnant with possibilities. And this study comes to terms with the idea uh, or the question about what happens to space when education and spaces of learning are being displaced by the internet and our international connectivity. Uh, you and I know that we may have found our center within the architectural studio, and yet somehow now we get to draft on the couch at home. Uh, if we're connected um, via Bluetooth, we can draft on the beach, uh, or uh, on the train coming into studio in that last point of the charrette. We are working uh, as much as we're having fun everywhere. So the notion of being connected to the world and yet being on a campus or in a place are two concepts that would normally be pit against each other, but they're not, in fact. And arguably, with the uh, advent of, of online education, where the population of a Harvard may go from 10,000 to 100,000, the notion of residency at Harvard all of a sudden becomes even more important. This is UVA, of course. And so all of a sudden, the role of architecture as the vessel for experience, as the place of happening, uh, becomes even more central. Consider the role of being there and being linked uh, at the same time which ones of these screens are replicating what's on the projected screen and who's actually looking at babies and dogs and cats and other videos. Uh, in fact, uh, maybe this is not so productive, but we also know that we learn differently now and we multitask uh, in different ways. The, um, the idea that architecture uh, may instill uh, a different relationship amongst us is also not new. Uh, this is the Harkness table at Exeter, something that you and I probably take for granted by now because we've all sat around conference rooms and, uh, and tables and discussed. But during its time, uh, this was a revolutionary idea, the notion that a professor would be speaking to you uh, in, in a kind of, in a platform of equity uh, where students prepare the class and where uh, the topic of the class is debated uh, in a more discursive way. Uh, a moment where furniture, uh, organization, and the configuration of a discussion matters all the more. Of course, uh, we're all familiar with parliamentary debates also, and they, they're not only uh, given to us by the academic context, but indeed uh, they come from other forms of governance uh, of which we're also a product. Um, but all of this is to underline that the relationship between teaching, learning, uh, technology, and architecture are complex ones, uh, even in those instances where you have uh, teal spaces, this is one at MIT, where notions of physicality, tactility, immediacy of contact is operating at one scale, but at another scale you are also connected uh, to far off lands uh, across time zones and working intimately with uh, people um, who may offer peer-to-peer -peer instruction uh, without actually being there. And so uh, we're coming to terms, essentially, with the ways in which connectivity may give us something that um, the traditional classroom has never been able to do. 
I personally was very much impacted also by Neil Gershenfeld's notion of uh, his course, How to Make Almost Anything. And it was not, I was interested in initially because of its emphasis on making, which is a central part of our architectural practice. But how he taught it was even more important. He almost was never there. Uh, the space was never completely determined. There was a workshop in the center, but there were computational spaces on the side, classrooms, fab labs, and so forth. But maybe most importantly was this notion that we were being taught uh, by each other, uh, connected to Munich and Manchester and you know, San Diego and Kenya. Uh, there was this notion that um, uh, students were teaching teachers and each other as much as top-down education. Why is it, tell me, that right now uh, we can essentially elect what we do when we want to do it, and yet education has not caught up with this idea. The education that you're undergoing is basically still bundled. Uh, uh, the classical pedagogies are bundled around four years, and after which you get your, your degree, uh, and yet it's completely arbitrary. It could have been done in three years or maybe seven years. Uh, but culture, as I said, is changing. We don't need to own cars or bikes. We can share them. And uh, the kind of lateral flexibility of not waiting for Thursday to see friends, but to be able to binge it uh, during stormy weathers uh, is something that one could as easily do with education if we were able to debundle it. And therefore, pairing up your education with uh, notions of research for half a year here or practice another half a year there. Uh, for those of you who want to make it through college in three years or extend it for another four, all of those would be permissible. But then again, uh, this would make the space of education um, all the more important. And this project by uh, Michael Van Valkenburg uh, at Harvard which is relatively simplistic, if you think about it, just throwing some chairs in a space, is at the same time quite radical in the way that it, it, it turns the cow paths, which are part of this collegiate environment, uh, into a social space, into a place of interaction, and into a space of, of scholarship. At no time, I would argue, is the idea of education and the place of learning more important. And so in great part, these three schools of architecture are happening at a moment in time where an idea about making place uh, is all the more important. Now, there are many precedents, of course, for schools of architecture, and I can't underline how different these three schools are. Uh, they are so different ideologically it would be like trying to compare a school of dentistry and agriculture and graphic design. They are fundamentally different. And yet, obviously, programmatically, they, certain, uh, they, they share certain attributes. On the left is the Sao Paulo School of Architecture. And this is a classic image. I thought it to be 68. In fact, it's in the 1970s in one of the large manifestations of that time. And effectively quite important for the days that we live in today. The possibility that space can be the platform for free speech, that space is uh, the place of manifestation and the space of collection. In other words, the studio space as uh, the place of uprising. In the center, of course, is GSD and one of the fantastic experiences I had in that space was this idea of flexibility in the studio space, the place of the individual, but the theatricality that is instilled in the idea of the trays that, that ascend up and create a kind of amphitheater where the spectacle of production is as much about seeing as being seen. 
And then the third instance, of course, is Kuhlhaus's addition to Cornell, which is already embedded in this techno technological revolution. And yet he felt compelled that the space was actually very important. Maybe most interestingly, this is the one project out of all of the projects that were done for Cornell where the addition to the buildings become more important than the buildings themselves. And it was a kind of ingenious reversal of hierarchy uh, uh, in that project. And for me, maybe most importantly, uh, embedded in these buildings is some idea about establishing a meaningful relationship between part and whole or the idea of Gesamtkunstwerk with the notion of Rudolf's uh, Yale building, where the stacking of the auditorium, the library, the gallery, and the arena for the critique. The critique is a uniquely architectural phenomena. Many other disciplines are beginning to absorb and rob design of what it does, but in, a, in fact, that central space is very much unique to what we do with the ideas of the studios and other administrative uh, spaces as part of the donut that uh, frames that space and looks inward onto the spectacle of, of the culture that is being produced in that central shaft. Notice also that the, the building doesn't have skylights, as it were. The morphology of the building is, uh, absorbs the skylights as part of it. And so it's very much uh, part of the structure and the configuration of the building. Now, interestingly, interestingly enough, uh, as your gracious introduction suggested, much of our work really stems from uh, an idea about making. And we stumbled into large commissions sort of out of the blue. Before that, uh, our contribution, if you like, to the architectural discussion had to do with the introduction of making and the alteration of means and methods uh, into the design process as part of the uh, transformation of the political role of the architect. Uh, I think all of you understand this tense dynamic, and this goes back to the title about a measure of tolerance, that over the decades, uh, the legal edifice that surrounds architecture imposes on us a kind of dictum that separates us from the very things that we built. So architects essentially are responsible for design intent, and contractors own the means and methods, the way in which something is going to be built. But that's radical if you think about it, because it essentially decapitates you uh, from everything that one would think you want to be responsible for. And so this reversal has very much to do with uh, what we brought back into the design studio. Now, as part of that, of course, uh, these projects live in a larger environment uh, to which they owe other kinds of responsibilities. In Georgia Tech, uh, we were working with the Hinman Building, a modernist artifact uh, designed by Heffernan, and a unique moment in time where hybrid technologies of concrete, steel, brick, uh, and glass were being used in innovative ways uh, some hundred years ago. And we've seen classic ways in which uh, transformations of existing buildings have worked throughout history. In, on the right, you can see uh, Scarpa and the way in which he delicately superimposed his interventions on Castelvecchio, always objectifying the planes uh, such that 
the history of the building could wrap under the skins that he was introducing, whether those skins were floor plates or wall plates. And uh, in the Venturi Scott Brown edition to the Tate, the more devious way in which uh, the classical language is unfolded or grafted uh, from the existing building and then through a kind of permutation of scales uh, brought into a, a new institution. Uh, I like to think that our project does not combat with the building, but plays judo with it. It understands certain forces at work and then draws them uh, into the context of the building. Now, uh, our building is the one at the bottom, but it recognizes also that the School of Architecture isn't a building, but multiple buildings, each of which contain uh, an important anchor, the library being here, the shop being there, auditorium. But ours is this unique building that is a public space, uh, the dimension of a high bay that connects a front quad, which used to be parking, into a back quad, which would be a space of fabrication. And so the urban position of this hall is actually important to uh, build a narrative about architecture as a piece of urbanism. And what they were interested, of course, in this project was to build a new graduate school where uh, a new kind of interdisciplinary construct could be made between the PhD program, the masters, as well as some of the undergraduates to create a flexible space where the studio is at the heart and soul of the life of the building. It has technical mandates, it, it has research mandates, cultural ones in which certain events may happen in there, and the whatever space, the, those things that happen when the teachers are gone, and those other things that you know what they are happen. It also maps out the possibility that we're, we work differently. I already outlined this in the beginning, but the role and the dimension of your desk is no longer the same. With the economical and real estate uh, pressures of schools today, uh, architecture schools happen to be one of the most uh, expensive forms of education because space uh, is required for it in a way that is inflexible. You, everybody has a dedicated space. Um, but with the idea of lockers and shelves and reduced uh, uh, table sizes that, that, that still permit uh, an ample uh, sheet size, uh, we also came up with another way of intervening and creating more density in this high bay space. So the high bay space is this extraordinary space, and it was up to us to essentially ruin it. And in fact, we realized that the client was asking for a lot that may actually fill it up completely. But we recalled the, the space of the Tate. The high bay of the Tate has been seen as that public space of promenade. Uh, scaled differently, we've seen it act as a piece of urbanism or the space of the sublime. And this is one of those spaces. The Hinman building, which was a research building within which many technologies were invented. Uh, the rotary of the helicopter, for instance, was tested out in this space. Um, and how to transform it into a school of design. Initially, as I said, the program was so large that effectively it filled the entire high bay. And all of our strategies were focused around the introduction of a large figure that would respect its tension with relationship to the vessel that framed it, the high bay outside. And it is at this moment when the markets came uh, tumbling. And effectively, after much discussion and negotiation, the budget came down, I don't remember right now, from 15, 16 million to 11 million. But so too, the program was diminished. And in many ways, I think the 
the productivity or the, uh, the power of the scheme today is the result of this reduction. Uh, our challenge was to create the maximum flexibility on the horizontal axis uh, by freeing it up from anything vertical and thus conceptually turning the building upside down, hanging it from the ceiling. Uh, there's a structure and the gantry cranes on the sides uh, that became the elements around which all of the new architecture was uh, to be suspended. In this case, you're seeing it under construction with the third floor studios on the right connecting to a tray of studio space that then will connect down to the second floor. So conceptually, the project hinges around a raised floor with all of the wiring and mechanical functions with all of the desks on wheels that can be moved around. And then the project, as I said, is built upside down. The truss suspends, um, the gantry crane more rather, suspends the, uh, the suspended studio. A staircase delicately drops down. The second means of egress through a spiral stair on the south wing and the lights hang low except for those moments in which public events happen drawing it up uh, into the ceiling. Uh, it also allows the horizontal flexibility, allows for the, the design space to speak to the research spaces of computation and PhD uh, research on one side with the fab lab and the exhibition spaces on the other. So the notion is that uh, there is a very different space of interaction between discipline groups but with the thesis of one act or one action holding this all together and this, no, this idea of suspension. Literally, the structuring of the entire building is formed around uh, the suspension, in this case, of the guillotine wall between the design studio and the gallery, uh, the suspension of a new spiral stair that delicately sits uh, on a wooden base uh, as a crit room on the periphery of the design studio, uh, the, the, the suspended tray uh, above uh, landing, it's there landing, unfolding from the uh, structural system to land on a conference table, and uh, of course uh, the spiral stair uh, shrink-wrapped as it were uh, with this diaphanous uh, mesh uh, that uh, lands it on the ground. Now, there are obviously themes that we are interested in, and, uh, and I will speak to them as, if you like, commercial breaks throughout the lecture. But historically, there's always been this tension in architecture about uh, buildings and what they represent and how they contain uh, complex and contradictory phenomena. And my interest in, in this image comes from the idea that the figure of the egg is, is really the, the shape uh, that is being revealed, but it's the configuration of the snakeskin that allows for that tensile uh, expansion and contraction uh, that enables it to be swallowed. And uh, the architecture of some of the details come from this, the, the idea that a very generic stair may yet be framed by uh, a steel encasing that produces the tension uh, of, uh, of the figure and what is contained. And so the architecture of this uh, is at once quite diaphanous but with the light quite objectified in relationship to how it becomes present. The other way, of course, in which it becomes present is those things that you always hope for but can never completely anticipate, that ultimately this is a factory for production and it is a place of manifestation. And so here uh, moments in which large-scale installations are floated above the space uh, large lectures, uh, the Beaux-Arts Ball, uh, cinema, and a range of other events that uh, come through the campus uh, get rearranged in this space. 
the operational aspect of this building also through the back door, uh, opening up a garage door to the fabrication area in the back is also critical because it, it really uh, reinforces this notion of the public room as an extension of the campus. I, I like to tell you the story about uh, the front facade uh, and the budgetary constraints of this building and how we ran out of money so we didn't polish the uh, R-E-S-E, -E, uh, marking the transition from this as a research building into the School of Architecture. Um, uh, a very constrained budget and a kind of uh, economy of means uh, that made us think about historically all of the flexible spaces uh, that have informed uh, not only other building types, but spaces of architecture also. And how this is somehow respondent uh, to a larger debate about flexibility uh, throughout the years. Melbourne is a distant cousin uh, of Atlanta in that sense. Uh, we were lucky to inherit a dean who was uh, an incredible uh, engine behind the competition. He articulated four themes that he wanted to address through the competition. Uh, one about the design studio of the future and how it evolves and changes from what you and I grew up with. Uh, second, what is the academic environment when you explicitly call on an idea about uh, learning in an interdisciplinary world? And what is a living building when it works not only with the campus, but that it foresees a life cycle uh, that speaks to moments when you and I are no longer alive? And maybe most importantly, how is it that in a school of architecture, not unlike other buildings, but particularly in this case, you are no longer working for a client. The architect all of a sudden has over a thousand clients, the students, the faculty, and everybody who will inherit this building sees this as a kind of formal manifestation, a built manifestation of a piece of pedagogy. And in, in many cases, I would say that all of these three projects have embedded in them this idea of paradigmatic moments that are speaking to the nature of materials, uh, typologies, and conditions uh, that are poignant and specific in relationship to lessons that can be learned. Now, those of you, know, those of you who know Melbourne also know that uh, uh, RMIT is the design school, and uh, Melbourne Uni is the research school. They've never had design in, in, in Melbourne Uni. Uh, this was the first time in history that Melbourne Uni was going to have dedicated studio spaces. And so our whole notion about this building was, well, you start with a studio space, and then you design all of the support spaces of labs and faculty offices to frame it, and potentially use this as a kind of crust through which light descends down to the public areas on the ground. Uh, having done all of the number crunching, this is still the economic crisis, remember that. It, it hit everywhere, not as badly, I would say, in Australia, but nonetheless, what they discovered very early in the process, there's one thing they cannot afford, the design studio. And so, all of a sudden, our problem was how do you, how are you going to make a school of architecture without its main program? We looked at it urbanistically, and the Neo-Georgian campus has many beautiful and spacious quads. Our building being at the center of campus, lodged around what's called the concrete lawn to its left, we realized that if we pack the site, it's possible to create yet another quad on the inside because there's a moment at which you go from the double-loaded corridor 
and you widen it to become an atrium where potentially, or just potentially, you could turn the horizontal studio space into a kind of vertical condition. And so we teased out the idea of what it would mean to essentially flip the design studio in the atrium space. The atrium space would essentially take the studio that would have originally been on top, rotated them down, essentially in the corridors. Uh, imagine taking six-foot corridors, smuggling three extra feet out of them, uh, basically mitigating the net to gross uh, area of the building, and then robbing spaces depending on scheduling and programming so that the sp studio spaces leak into research spaces, exhibition spaces, and dedicated classrooms in order to become the life of the building. So the building essentially operates with this principle in mind. You can see on the left all of the studio spaces becoming petrified in the context of the furnishings that define the edges of the space. Now, but going back, we have to also examine the ways in which this building is part of an urban network without which it could not serve the various disciplines on campus. Uh, the connection to Swanson Street, uh, the main access coming into school uh, on access with the administration building defines a south court, a lawn, that gives the first impression of the building. Uh, working in relationship to what used to be a service court, uh, the new front court uh, faces the Elizabeth Murdoch building and uh, uh, introduces a promenade through the building that connects it to the concrete lawn to the left. Uh, the internal quad, if, if you like, uh, is on a piano nobile, one floor up, cascading downstairs and connecting to the anthropology building and a cafe to the northeast. The services of the building are brought in under a cantilever that connects to a fab lab that doubles its space as people start building on the north edge of site. And finally, of course, the building activates itself in relationship to the student union on the concrete lawn, but more importantly also engages the Joseph Reed facade, which I will speak to a little bit later, a classical facade, a vestige of a bank from downtown Melbourne that was introduced onto this site and slapped onto another building without any recognition of floor heights, porosities, or operabilities of the previous building. And the competition asked everybody to uh, come up with an agenda for this. So the Piano Nobile essentially raises the School of Architecture on a pedestal while allowing the base to breathe. The library, the fab lab, and the gallery produce a kind of triad in which the research and production of knowledge happen in one, the manufacturing and the translation of that knowledge into making happen in the other, and its communication with a larger public happens in the third program with a street that runs right through it. The library here uh, essentially heaves as it's snuck under the landscape but also looks out, out onto the south lawn. Uh, the gallery faces um, the concrete lawn. And most importantly, the design hall uh, establishes for the first time a direct relationship with the Elizabeth Murdoch building, uh, a, a different uh, version of the guillotine wall gla glazed over 60 feet long, raises up and begins to ventilate the space. Uh, those of you who've been to Melbourne understand that most days are just like today here, uh, dry, crisp, and uh, with natural vent ventilation being its, its main force, but also spaces of learning, communicating between indoors and outdoors. Uh, with the activation of two planes, the upper and the lower, in tandem with each other. In section, then, the idea of the promenade that goes through the building has all of the public auditoria and mass teaching arena 
underground, which absorbs all of the other schools uh, within the School of Architecture. Uh, so that's, th these are shared facilities. The street going through the building is essentially uh, one of the gates into the campus altogether. And uh, the design studio hall floats aloft with one peak, uh, a cone of vision that is framed as you go through it, uh, revealing uh, the space of activity above. Essentially, the entire roof uh, and indirect lighting, natural daylighting, with one dedicated design studio space uh, suspended uh, from uh, its center. And this, for us, was uh, quite important. Historically, we have seen many moments in which uh, a kind of iconic uh, architecture is located as a kind of symbolic uh, attribute uh, of different architectures. The Tempietto uh, atop the Gianicolo is one of those instances where the temple is framed in a kind of concealed and framed courtyard. And uh, because of your lack of accessibility to it, it, you don't actually understand its scale. It looks monumental. It is miniature. It is actually a folly. Uh, in New Haven, uh, Kahn's museum conceals what is otherwise basically a service there through a monolithic tube of concrete silky in its construction, monumentalizing uh, a kind of um, uh, column-like artifact uh, uh, within the space. And then, uh, more, even more suggestively, uh, Gary in, in uh, Berlin, where the tension between the configurative nature of the fabric of offices around the bank space uh, is in tension with the figuration of the conference room in the center. Um, zoomorphic in many ways, uh, it, it draws out the potential of this strategy that we've seen uh, through the centuries. But note also that in all of these three instances, the morphological and figural nature of these two architectures are always in tension with each other. Uh, they're separated. Our question was, what would it mean if the architecture of the building were pliant enough such that its own language would be free enough to produce its figure? So consider a situation in which the main attribute of the building, its structural system, LVLs that span over 22 meters, become the basis for a coffered ceiling system so deep that you could stand within the depth of that ceiling, but also structural, structurally stable enough that one can suspend a studio space within it, three floors of it actually, such that you record the passage of structure as it goes from a thick and colossal system to a system of veneers suspended in tension at the bottom. This tectonic ruse, of course, uh, is participant to the idea that we had in Georgia Tech, that the ground would, would, would stay uh, infinitely flexible to enable all these activities, and that this dedicated studio space would be just for the visiting critics while the other students are roaming around in these trays uh, looking out onto it, and uh, maintaining the kind of freedom that the ground uh, requires. Note also here that uh, the figure stands off-center in a kind of contraposta position as it's given lateral stability in its anchoring to the balconies on the side, uh, essentially being activated by circulation, but also torquing its body in one way uh, drawing the veneers of wood down its sides, but also its structure. Now, all of this, of course, is part and parcel of a larger relationship to the ecologies of the building. The idea was to use locally harvested woods uh, and indeed work with 
cross-laminated timber systems for the floors uh, in relationship to concrete and make the building virtually 80%, 90% off-site with precast concrete, perforated zinc, so that the assembly of the building would essentially happen as a kit of parts uh, on site after the fact. Uh, I've already spoken to the idea of natural ventilation, but that also happens at multiple scales, where the central design hall is operating at one scale, but also the microclimates of the offices and the studio spaces are uh, replicating that at a smaller unit. The building then doesn't have a cost per square foot. It has a variable cost per square foot. So we put essentially the dollar figures uh, to a higher uh, expense in the center, let's say at $370 a square foot. But as the onion gets peeled and goes out to the edge, you reduce that figure to uh, 250 and then $150 a square foot. It is a truly industrial building with the majority of its systems exposed. And in that way, the pedagogical exposure of all of its systems becomes part of its organizational craft. The coffering systems uh, being framed off-site, uh, delivered early mornings uh, to the site, uh, spanning across. The entire roof was built in less than two weeks. Um, and then situated within the space uh, as part of some of the larger systems uh, of the floors. You can begin to see the emphasis of the roof uh, essentially heaving down in tension uh, in relationship to uh, the suspended studio. You can see the mass of the top translate into the veneers of the base. You can see also the perforated skin where the design studio essentially becomes a, an acoustic baffle. And then the veneers at the bottom produce these other acoustic baffles within which are housed the lighting and the sprinkler systems, but also become a microacoustic environment for the conferences that are contained just underneath that part. At the top of the building, you can see, of course, the indirect light, but a key piece of this equation was also a staircase that escapes the kind of directness of the fire stairs or the elevators, uh, and in fact becomes part of the social space of the building, if not a series of amphitheaters that uh, in a Y configuration, you go up and get to make a decision at half point where you go up again in two ways, and then go up another way and then make another decision to, uh, to go up again. The, uh, intersecting nature of the geometry of the Y stairs produces a kind of a Piranesian interlock within which the millwork of the stair wraps on the interior of that space as it becomes bleacher-like. The acoustic uh, surface of felt frames the sides uh, and then we were so uh, enamored, in fact, by the structural system of raw steel uh, we asked, essentially, the uh, acoustic consultants, what would it mean if we exposed the steel underneath as a, as a way of revealing its structure? Uh, and in fact, uh, we're able to pull it off and, uh, and uh, present it in its raw state. So the building is very much also about this conversation between uh, the raw and the cooked. These two come into direct confrontation through a highly crafted and a highly raw interior. Um, the spaces of the interior are also reinforced and stacked by the cross-laminated timber, which essentially is the formwork for the concrete itself. Uh, the cross-laminated timber screwed in with uh, steel bolts, uh, rebar that is floating above it and poured with concrete becomes the structural sl slab as a hybrid and uh, then becomes the structural basis of the studio space as it goes up. Again, just to reiterate, uh, at the base, the space of the corridor 
gets opened up through uh, the, the kind of pivot door that brings the exhibit spaces out into the outside for making other studio spaces. A floor above that, conference areas, model making tables right outside of the design studios. Uh, a floor above that, drafting tables that happen just outside of the master's program research areas. And then at the top level, uh, cubicles of crit spaces and conference areas in relationship to the PhD areas. All of this, of course, is to try to get interactions between the undergraduate, the master's, and the PhD program on the sectional axis. Uh, notice also the ways in which uh, we're robbing space by pushing the furniture outboard, essentially cantilevering it out, getting an extra foot out of the corridor, but uh, getting also uh, uh, a little bit more program uh, out of uh, the edge of the building as you stack up and go into these uh, spaces. Essentially, just like the Georgia Tech building, shrink wrapping the skin of the extend mesh towards the outside. Here with a mock-up, you can see the uh, uh, tortured uh, metalwork that essentially snakes its way uh, around to become part of the infrastructure of, of uh, making figure. Uh, of course, when you're on axis with uh, the mesh, it's so diaphanous, it's, it's not there. And where you're in deep perspective, it, 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 it acquires the, a, a, sort, a sort of presence. What was very important for us was to kill the notion of the guard or the railing and the idea of triple stacking in an atrium. Uh, for us, it was very important to make one space that was totally transparent, such that the back surface of people pinning up uh, the students' drawings become the image of that enclosure, and that bodies are never blocked by anything but the very activities of furnish furnishings and, and people. This diaphanous strategy is also brought to the outside where the corrugated, um, perforated uh, zinc skin uh, protects the building on three sides that receive a lot of sun uh, with a customized uh, perforation strategy that uh, essentially uh, becomes solidified under certain light and transparent uh, under others as you begin to take different positions, uh, whereby with two dowels that operate rotationally, uh, you get these customized relationships to uh, see out the building and begin to engage the very landscape that you're creating uh, as an extension of the building. The precast technologies of, of Melbourne are also outstanding. Uh, using, uh, unfortunately, not enough of the limestone aggregate that they have there, uh, the precast is uh, done in very sophisticated ways to produce a, an orange hue, much like the stone uh, of the campus, uh, tessellating the southern skin to produce multiple scales and, and studios that can allow different levels of porosity in them. Uh, and then you can see at the base the lawn in relationship to the library and the exhibit spaces as part of the public realm at the base of the building with uh, also the top of the building serving a large uh, open deck that looks out onto the concrete lawn and the alumni room which looks back onto downtown Melbourne uh, as part of the colossal precast systems that, that, that work to give body to the building. The corrugation, of course, uh, is very simple and generic on the one hand, but uh, based on its rotations and the, the way that the light is cast onto it, uh, acquires a kind of a potent and, and mannered reading depending on the time of the day. The Joseph Reed facade I already introduced as this exemplary piece of architecture that was uh, summarily uh, cut off uh, from uh, the bank on Collins Street that was demolished and put in front of the old school of architecture uh, and was part of our inheritance. Part of our mission was to activate that facade 
to give it structure, to give it accessibility, and essentially give it its uh, proper position in relationship to uh, the concrete lawn. Part of that was to engage in this discussion about uh, form and content and the ambiguous ways in which one uh, reads buildings and indeed uh, create a reciprocity between what is on the inside and what is on the outside. This facade is not a standalone feature. It not only needs structure behind it, but it needs lateral bracing as a central part of it. So for us, the question was not only how to uh, study the facade, draw it, understand its apertures, its depth, and the way in which it uh, produces a depth on the Western light, but how to introduce uh, a trabeated structural system behind it, uh, to mark the passage of light through windows, clear stories, and doors at its base, but most importantly, to develop a lateral bracing system that connects it back to the main body of the uh, building, erecting a new, uh, essentially, uh, beam that is occupiable, essentially a conference area lounge that gets people back into the facade and over the uh, concrete lawn. Now, this brings me back to other kinds of disciplines, because here you're obviously looking at a very complex geometry that is negotiating between the norms and conventions of the classical language on the other hand, and the idea of a simple tube uh, passage with a rail on the uh, opposite uh, side. And so how to calibrate uh, this geometry was a central part of our conception, which brings me to one of our commercial breaks and the idea that we discovered in the design of the Zahidi house when we were working with corrugated uh, galvanized metal. And we realized that corrugation actually is a material manifestation of the theorem of a ruled surface. It is a developable surface. Its ribs are the vertical lines that prove that something is buildable as a sheet material. And in this case, the undulations at the base enable the space of the skin to emerge to connect a staircase between the living room and the landscape. But even more importantly, the animation is an illustration that in architecture, drawing is not illustration. It is already the act of construction. So at any given moment, any of those geometries that you saw could have been built because the cor corrugation allows that. So programming it is that, uh, is that architectural process by which you undertake the right fit. In the context of, of Melbourne, it was really about uh, negotiating uh, through form the ruled surfaces that are needed as mediation between the windows and essentially the corridor on the opposing side with this large figure of the lounge hovering over the exhibit space uh, on the western side of the building. Uh, abstract, uh, somehow suggestive, elusive, and yet uh, illegible uh, as, uh, in, in terms of its reference, and yet uh, an important part of the suspended attributes. You've got the, the roof with the suspended studio, the facade with the lounge, and so forth. As we transitioned from those two projects to um, Toronto, we realized that we had a completely different situation. And so some of the themes that guided our work would probably take on completely different forms and configurations. Spadina Circle, you can see almost on center of the slide, is all the way to the back of uh, the uh, image. And it's an important circle, one of the curious and only figures of the grid in Toronto that connects back down to the lake. Anchoring the western portion of the campus, it becomes the gateway, the threshold between Kensington neighborhood and the rest of campus. 
Knox College, which has anchored uh, the southern side, uh, side of the site for uh, a good century, uh, has always had an address. And yet, the northern side has accrued a series of buildings, kind of riffraff, uh, along the back that could not, no longer function in any way or form and needed to be sacrificed in order to be able to uh, revive the building in some way or another. At this point, we're in the lowest point of the economy, so all of the ambitions they had for expansion, the, the uh, occupation of the site in a more robust way uh, were almost predetermined as the tightest bo box with the least amount of surface space. So what we had to do was to find within the circulatory system of the building the most latent economies to take the circulation around back on itself to introduce a northern facade for the first time in history, to insert the services, the cores, the stairs, the bathrooms, anchoring the four corners, and essentially making out of its existing courtyard the large flexible hall, a space much like this, but that can be cut up into different pieces for classrooms and so forth, and then really uh, imagine that the classrooms are in the cellular spaces, whereas the studio spaces are on the other sides where there's open spaces. So the connection essentially between the city and Knox College historically has been firmed up by a beautiful neo-Gothic structure that is always visible from the south, but stood to be blocked by an addition to the north. So part of our mission work was to develop a new foundation for that tower extend program potentially under the carpet in a landscape to the north, respecting the skyline of the building, and then carving that landscape into spaces of courtyards and outdoor teaching spaces with additions that would bring skylights into the periphery of the building. So this, this project is very much not only about its architecture, but the kind of landscape and urbanism that it sponsors. It needs to negotiate complex urban phenomena, but suffice it to say that we're trying to maximize the kinds of additions that can be made onto it uh, in the near future as they emulate the kinds of pavilions that are part and parcel of the existing uh, building. If the building works symbolically on the north-south axis, the reality is that the pedestrian circulation works on the east-west. So there's a contradiction of, of the building. Its functional axis is east-west. The image of the building is driven from the north-south axis. You exit out onto the south, onto a new terrace with a cafe underneath it that takes advantage uh, of the sun. And yet the street that goes through it uh, expands around areas of exhibition, the great hall, uh, the fab lab, all of the student lockers, uh, the student club spaces, all of the collective spaces that are in fact accessible 24-7. So the new identity of the building, which is effectively vehicular, uh, is then embraced by these other arcades that come into and across the east-west legs uh, on one side with the arcade, on the other side with a plaza that opens back onto the school edge. The street then uh, populates not only with programs and cafes and lounges, the Fab Lab being a double height space that looks out onto North Spadina, but borrows light from the third floor into the second and into the Great Hall, which is at the center of this scheme. Here you can see the street space with the kind of spatial manipulations of these terraces to bring uh, effectively uh, some of the key elements of the building together. Uh, a connection to the south, a connection to the north by way of the basement and the top floor, but most importantly, really, the idea of a roof a structural roofscape 
that brings in light not only to the studio space at the top, but deep down the, uh, a kind of cascade of a uh, amphitheater space that looks out onto a window into the core of the building where there was the original courtyard where the flexible uh, uh, hall is at the center. This hall then is saddlebagged on all sides with studio crit spaces, classrooms, uh, lounges that not only bring bigger audiences into it, when you have the rock stars lecture here, all of those spaces will be uh, populated with alternative screens, but the space in the center is also able to be locked off and completely insular for classrooms. So the connectivity of these spaces also borrows light from the skylights above to illuminate uh, the core center. Uh, naturally, as you can imagine, uh, uh, the idea of this was really to uh, animate the academic environment and interact between the masters above, the, uh, the, the undergraduate below, and the public uh, at the base. Uh, the role of co color here has a very direct relationship, of course, to Austin, uh, as we were in many ways uh, mentally atrophied with respect to questions of color. And what Austin did for us was give us that platform to research it further and to begin to think through uh, the various ways in which the polychromatic could become con conversant with uh, problems of acoustics and the various elements that had to be embedded within the logic uh, of the ceiling of that space. So effectively that the space could absorb all of the functions that need to go overhead and on its sides and yet be relatively seamless and, and mute. The space then has to work for large lectures. Uh, it has to be divisible by three. It could be uh, longitudinal or centralized or divisible by two. Uh, it is one of those spaces that becomes uh, a central part of the real estate transformation of the school. Uh, it needs to work to double the population uh, of the school. Uh, it's absolutely public at the base and yet a discreet but monumental stair brings you up and through the amphitheater space and again for the first time reorienting the building to northern Spadina in the studio space uh, at the top. Uh, effectively illuminated and revealing of the roofscape from the north. Um, The biggest move of this building and the biggest battle of the building has to do with that roofscape. Effectively, it's a concrete building with a grid of columns that come up to the third floor but stop right there. Because essentially bringing those, that column grid into the third floor would inhibit the flexibility that may be possible at the top level. So at all costs, what we wanted to do was to use the cores, stair cores, as the structural system off of which we could cantilever the roof, which is a kind of riff on the Firth of Fourth Bridge. And yet, when we cantilever the two in, a, in the form of a scissor truss, uh, the moment forces were way too much. And so they would either want to buckle in or you'd have to put so much concrete in the base that it would be essentially too expensive. So, we took the scissor, we took the cantilevers and stopped them earlier and then crossed the scissor earlier on, making effectively a keystone in the center that enabled a surface active structural system with skylights bringing northern light for the majority of the space, but southern light in the keystone spaces. Now, more importantly, we were told on one of my trips to Melbourne, I got a note from them that the roof is being value engineered because it's unbuildable and that uh, we're going to make a flat roof with round skylights in it. And we panicked and uh, said, we need to, we sent you a model. The model proves that it does work. They said, no, this is not uh, workable. So the staff aligned 
with me uh, to develop a um, mock-up within the context of our office that essentially proved that this was buildable. We framed uh, a, a series of studs uh, and proved to them that everything was built by a straight line. We cut some of the jipboard in smaller pieces, essentially proving that uh, this could be done by flat sheet construction with the kind of wedges of space that emerged with them to be taped up and uh, spackled over and essentially plastered. What we didn't know at the time was the way in which we could create a radiant slab out of this and essentially complete the environmental logic of the building through the roof itself. And as such, bring into alignment the structural, daylighting, environmental, and hydrological system of the building in one shot. Now, the tectonics of this, of course, are kind of interesting because on the one hand, when you think of a rule, uh, uh, a, a, a surface active structural system, you're thinking of concrete and therefore a seamless surface. But you already know that this is a stick-built building. It's got steel, it's got insulation, it's got all of the kind of fine grain of construction in, in there. In, in that sense, it's more like the nest. But the, the argument I'm making here, of course, is that architecture more often than not, after modernism, is the result of an increasingly complex relationship to the environment, and therefore the kind of purity of a simple concrete building is not even impossible anymore. Any real concrete that building that you see today is two layers of concrete, one on the outside, one on the inside, and insulation in the middle, if only to enable the kinds of mitigations that are required in instances like this. So the monolith of plaster that you see is, is ultimately uh, the radiant slab that is to be part of uh, the system overhead. Needless to say, all of these buildings, and I haven't spoken in these terms very much, are part of another regime of thinking that has to do with uh, the ways in which we think about the environment and the many techniques uh, that we need to bring to them. In this case, the green roof is not just a green roof, it is part of the pedagogical uh, program of the landscape department there. The building is very much a landscape building in the way that it uh, goes out into the landscape, the fab lab extending to the north, the cafe to the south, the daylighting of natural light, minimizing the use of electricity, uh, primarily for uh, the night times, and then developing an approach to the building that is more than anything pedestrian or with bicycles or with the streetcars, eliminating as much as possible uh, car use. And, and, and in essence, completely transforming the nature and the psychology of the roundabout, which is right now quite treacherous. Within the context of the micro section of the building, also to develop uh, a more uh, aggressive strategy towards uh, operable windows using displaced uh, ventilation uh, through the roof. Uh, the lighting I've already spoken about, but essentially using the baffles on top to reflect light. And most importantly, to develop a roof-shaped system that would not produce any uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, water feeds in the center of the building. The scissor truss is what brings the water to the edge down a central drain that then brings all of the stormwater har harvesting to the edge of the site to irrigate the site. Now, of course, if all of this looks uh, like it's innocent, it's anything but, because we had other imperatives about how we would slap on a new box in relationship to what is otherwise a very animate silhouette that is neo-Gothic. And so we wanted somehow the mapping and the indexing of this roof system to come together in this one drainage system which acts as a reveal between the old and the new, if not literally emulating the Gothic, but animating its skyline essentially to bring it down and back up um, to be able to 
speak in abstract terms uh, the conditions uh, of its architecture. In turn, if you can see that the skin system is very, very thin. And as with much of today's construction, it's not about weight and depth and mass. It's rather about all of the laminar systems that come together to conspire into the different performances of the skin. And yet we wanted somehow the depth of that thinness to be visible in the part-to-whole relationship. This part-to-whole relationship is another part of our investment in which questions of construction come into the foreground. In this case, the brick in Casa La Roca was the excuse around which we discovered the idea that the mortar dimension between brick is kind of arbitrary. That's why you have running bond and Flemish bonds. But thought of as a voided system, you can variegate that bonding system and then through a fold principle, not only give lateral structural stability to the wall, but also bring light and air into the structural system. So the integration of all of these systems was very much at the core of the thinking in the Toronto building. Now, in closing, I'll only throw, show these three slides that begin to tease out some of the investments of not only these projects, but a kind of ethic that we're bringing to the architectural conversation. The first that beyond broader principles of composition and ideas, buildings and environments are built out of matter and they come with limits, uh, panel sizes, unit sizes, and until we as architects get on top of our relationship to the agency of construction, we will never be able to fully inhabit uh, our potential role. In turn, there are strategic ways in which we have this conversation with the world. Understanding that convention drives so much of cost and that we can only get so much in front of the questions of, of means and methods, the critical judiciousness with which we have to tease out uh, customization in a world that is still driven by mass production. Of course, off-site production plays a big role in this and how you can radicalize what we can do as architects. But also to understand that building typologies in great part uh, are not merely an index of available repertoire of forms, but rather they produce possibilities. There's a potentiality in their variations. And most importantly, that as architects, uh, we are not making buildings. We are producing the world. Uh, if you map out our imprint on the environment, you know how much uh, carbon dioxide we unleash into the world. Uh, you understand that architecture has very much its political manifestations in the spaces it makes possible, in the pleasure that it gives, in the way that it instills the possibility of a civic realm. And so that whatever we do, whether it's that installation or whether it's a building or the public space, we're very much conversant with our situated relationship with the politics of this world. And in many ways, these three schools are trying to do that within the environment of spaces of learning. Thank you very much.